Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm John Ricard. This is Camera Work Podcast. And I'm really happy because I have a guest. And anyone who follows this podcast, which there's not a lot of you, I have to say. But for those of you who do, we don't have a guest that often. So anytime there's a guest, I'm really excited. So this guest is Nathan Wright. And I don't know a lot about Nathan, but he's a Leica shooter. And that's really why he's on, correct? Do you give me just a little yes. bit of background on yourself first before I get into like how you and I connected? All right. Uh... We'll do the biography stuff first. I'm an expat uh, living in Japan. Um, I do still life photography mainly. If you notice, I got a camera stand, some lights back here. Uh, mainly what I will be doing would be like uh, audio stuff and jewelry um, for advertising. But I also do events. And uh, that's how I got into Leica photography was I was using actually uh, some Fujifilm cameras and I didn't like the interface inconsistencies. And uh, once I borrowed a Leica from my friend, uh, M9, and then, yeah, M9, I was like, hey, when you turn the dial, it actually does what it says it wants to do. It doesn't right. go into half stops when you don't want it to do it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I was sold, and uh, <laughs> I picked up a 240, like, a, in 2015. Right. And I've been shooting events, basically, just Leica since then. I don't know if that's a good intro. My name right. is That's a perfect answer. That's it. Right. Yeah. And the way you and I yeah. connected was you did a video that was something along the lines of like what Leica needs to change in order to be a perfect right. event camera. Right. And I thought the title, or I thought the concept of that was such a good concept that I made a response video. I answered everything you said. Yeah. I'm like, well, I agree with this or I don't good video. agree with it. Right. Well, thank you. And yours too. It inspired me to make mine. And then I said, um, and then I added my own in there that, um, you know, that I think they need to change or whatever. And uh, so I say, let's just talk in person. Yeah. And this is kind of free form. So don't worry about, you know, questions or order or anything like that. We're just going to go with it. But I'll tell you just right off the bat, one of the things that drives me the craziest about when you explain to someone why you use a Leica, which I think is an interesting topic to talk about often because so many people are using cameras that are different from Leicas. The Leica is really the only, M, let's say a Leica M is the only right. camera that is like a Leica M. There's nothing at all in any way like a Leica M. A lot of cameras look like it, but they're nothing like the same when you're using it. I'm not trying to say the camera's better. I'm merely stating that it's different. But the thing that drives me crazy is if you try to explain, and for me, when I'm explaining it in an article or a video, I'm trying to explain it in like, hey, I love this thing and you might love it too. The same way people who uh, quit alcohol, they become sober and they're running around telling everybody to be sober or people who get religion and they're running around telling everybody about religion or me when I you know, got into heavy metal and I'm telling everybody, that's all it is. But people think like that you're trying to justify your purchase, that you feel a need to justify to them why you spent $7,000 on a camera. And I'm like, that is so stupid. And I see it every time I write an article. It's like people really believe I'm just trying to justify my purchase by saying what's good about the camera. And that drives me crazy. Does that bother you? And if not, what bothers you the most in that area? Well, to be fair, everyone, um, every, every forum, I, I go to a lot of different forums and a lot of people are like, you're just trying to justify your purchase. And they're talking about Fujifilm or Sony or anybody. So I find that that's kind of a stupid that's a stupid thing to say anyway, because everyone everywhere says it when they're coming from a different brand that's maybe less expensive or doesn't have the latest features or whatever. Um, or, 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 if, or if the other brand is perceived not to have a function, but someone still buys it. Right. It's like, right. you're, just, you're just trying to, to justify your purchase. Well, the fact is that maybe, maybe I just like the camera or that, or that person likes the camera right. or whatever yeah it's uh right. like why can't why can't people believe that it's real like now i've been shooting with an m since not only an m but i incorporate the m into my shooting my personal and my professional work since 2013 like and i'm up to my third body fourth if you count the short time i owned the original monochrome but like why would i spend that much money and invest so much of my real work into this tool if i didn't genuinely love it like why is that so hard to believe that I genuinely love the camera that I'm trying to convince yeah. you that my money was well spent. It's not that. And I wish people would see it that way that we love it in the same way. Like I said, if you got me in 85, I was trying to tell you how great Judas priest was. It's the same thing. And that's <laughs> it. I'm trying to justify why I bought that album. I'm not trying to justify why I bought the camera. Now 
when it comes to videos, right now, you know, you yeah. made, you've made at least that one on the Leica. Have you made other Leica videos? I don't think I've seen any other um, I did, you know, I did really, I did two super duper long videos about the Leica SL back when I purchased the, okay. um, I have a Fujifilm, I had a Fujifilm X-H1 okay. and uh, I, I bought it <laughs> when it was new, man. And like eight months later, it was worth half brand yeah. new. Anyway, that's a kind of I, odd camera because it doesn't really it doesn't make sense that camera it doesn't really fit in anywhere yeah. each one it's a kind of bizarre camera that yeah it, it, it's it. like it's got a grip like an slr but it still has the fuji and it has a nice display like the sl but it still has the dials which i spent 45 minutes it was way too long showing why the sl was just so much more streamlined and better to use than an x one right. right. uh, i did two videos like that but um I've done some reviews of Leica lenses right. uh, okay. of the Zoomicron 50 from 1969, as right. well as I did a unboxing slash review of the Feuchtländer 75. Oh, okay. But I haven't done any, th those the are the only ones okay. about Leica specifically. One. Done, yeah. I just did one, I don't know if you saw it on all the Leica lenses I own. It's kind of funny because when you look at it, I haven't seen lens, it yet. Oh, you have to look for all the lenses okay. are just so banged up and scratched. It's very funny. Like when I look back at the video, I'm like, wow, maybe I should take a little bit better care of these things. But um, one thing I liked about your video was that it, um, that the tone of the talking was right. And if I remember correctly, there's no music on it. And personally, I don't like when people put music underneath videos. It makes it hard for me to listen to the video. But um, there's this thing that drives me crazy with the like of videos people put out where it's always so pretentious and slow and to me that actually hurts the brand because Leica already has this reputation like it's only being used by dentists and it's the rich guy's camera and it's not for people who are really um taking pictures and then the fans of Leica like instead of fighting that by just making a more like raw gritty video they come up and reinforce that by going like now the Leica M is a precision instrument with a fine-tuned range and I'm like no like you're you're reinforcing this thing that I think is a mistake for Leica. What is photography? <laughs> photography is the division between light and shadow. Right. <laughs> right. Good and evil, you know, it's yeah. so pretentious. And, yeah. you know, there's this, I wish, maybe I'll find it and stick it into the video of this. We'll watch it. it. There's a Leica, I mean, sorry, there's a Nikon ad from the 60s or 70s, whatever. And it has like a Nikon F camera, which is of course their professional camera. Right. And it showed a passport, a scotch, like a map of the world. And then the, you know, and probably like a handwriting journal. And it's trying to sell this lifestyle. You're a Nikon F shooter. You know, you just take a drink and I guess a cigarette hit the world. That's the mystique that they're creating around the Nikon F, which of course is nobody's real life. There's three guys in the world really doing that. For the rest of us, that's the fantasy. And that's what Nikon was selling. And then Leica will sometimes do the thing you just said, this kind of, because Leica will do it themselves. And I think they sell the wrong lifestyle when they do that. Like when Leica makes a video and they show a, a collector's camera and they pull it out with the white gloves. I think that's such a mm. mistake. The fantasy for us is not to buy a camera and put it in a box and put white gloves on and take it out. The fantasy is that you, you know, you've got the cigarette and the bourbon and you're hitting the map, yeah. hitting the world yeah. with your passport and a journal. Like, yeah. That's what I think Leica should be selling to people. And I think so much of their um, marketing or branding, whatever you call it, is, is off in that regard. I was going to say, I kind of agree with that. Although at the same time, I guess I kind of straddle the line. I totally agree with that. But at the same time, they do, it's so obvious that they take more care in the, in their whole brand and the whole, the making of the camera, not just in how they, they keep the M2 and M3 design all the way, which is 80 fantastic. years or 70 years which in the future. Fantastic. But they're, they're so guarded over this design, but they're also, it's, it's very obvious that everything that they change is done very intentionally and because of that i think they have a tendency to you know maybe they don't want to intentionally be pretentious but they are just because of the fact that they have put so much effort into basically keeping a tradition that they created alive and they're the only camera company that does that they're actually keeping their own tradition alive like fujifilm right. are pretending to keep a tradition alive Right. So but I think it's, based it, on it's almost, 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. And at the same time, it's almost natural that that pretense exists, perhaps. Yeah, I just wish they wouldn't. And I don't know. You no, know, no, I, just I wish, agree. I wish that they would go out of their way to showcase more modern photographers that use their gear. Like there's a guy named Ruddy Roy who photographs in New York mm. and he's a street mm. photographer. His work is phenomenal. I mean, and he's mm. on the streets in Brooklyn and he doesn't shoot candidates because he always wants to interact with the person and he will go up and get their story about why they're just hanging out on this street and what it's like for them in terms of a job or family relationships or other personal problems they're dealing with. And the captions are as good as the picture is. And he was using Leica when I first became um, aware of him. And then he switched to Fuji for a while. And now all of his images seem to be tagged Leica again. So as far as I can see, he's a Leica shooter, but I look at it and I go like, why don't they highlight this guy instead of, you know, you go to like a big photo show and you go to like the Canon booth and then they're showing some guy that's doing something modern with a Canon camera. They're showing how he documents our glaciers melting. Then you go to Nikon and they show how they used it on the new Star Wars movie or something. And you go to Leica and it's like, Jim Marshall shot Woodstock on our campus. And you're like, uh, yeah, we yeah, know, yeah. we know. Can we just get past that? Like Nikon has a legacy of people of like the astronauts using their cameras, but they're not talking about it now. They're focused on it. Right, right, right. I really wish. Yeah, they're showing what people are doing. I, you know what, um, Albert kind of messed me up. I didn't like was the one, it was like a Tiananmen Square. There was I, a, wasn't this, there one and it wasn't a Leica picture or something? It was a, I think it was a Nikon. I think they, they took it with a Nikon or something like that. <laughs> and so, but they showed that it was a Leica R2 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Everybody thought it was like a Leica and it was, seemed like something Leica should be shooting, but it isn't. Yeah, you know? exactly. I mean, the, the spirit of that was pretty cool. You know, for, I like the photojournalist, like risking his life or whatever. And, oh, it's a, a Leica. And then I found out it was a Nikon. I was like, okay, that's kind of, right. <laughs> that's not cool. That's pretty funny. But um, so in terms of, like, so again, we both did a video about what Leica needs right. to improve. So if you had to distill that down to just one thing, what would you say, like, if you were in control of the M line and there was one change that you could make to the camera, what do you think is the one thing that's not right with the camera? And then after that, we're going to talk about what we like about it. But let's just get that out the way first. Boil it down to one thing. One thing. <laughs> now, one thing on the M10 then, or just the M line in general? Either one. It could be the M line in general or the M10. Either one. Okay, you know what? I'll have to talk you through this by saying what I would not change. Just because... Right, let's start there then. Okay. I would definitely not change the rangefinder. Um, especially on the M10. It's, I love that it's nice and bright and wide. Um, wouldn't change the mount. <laughs> Wouldn't change. You know what? Even I even like. It's kind of stupid, but I even like this latch down here where you take off the bottom. I, yeah, that's one of the many things that I would change. It. I mean, I've never, yeah. I've never had a problem with it. But yeah, yeah. Again, we all have this fantasy that one day we're going to be climbing a mountain and we're taking pictures and we're hanging off a rope. That, that's the fantasy yeah, yeah. that we're shooting yeah. you on reality. I'm shooting my daughter on her phone, but you know, but you always have this vision that you're going to be in that situation. You're going to go to change yeah. the, the film or the, not the film, but the card or the battery. You're going to drop this base plate and you can't shoot. What I wish they would do. And the crazy thing is, is when you remove the base plate, the cool yeah. thing, nothing falls out. Like the way the battery yeah, yeah. part, it does yeah. stay in. All they need to do is make a little setting inside that says, you know, a release shutter without base plate. And you should be able to say yeah. yes. That way, if you lost the base plate no, in an emergency, yeah. you could just continue yeah. to shoot. So if they did that, I'd be cool with keeping the base plate. But since they don't want to do that, yeah. I would personally get rid of it. But they I think could modernize it by, uh, you've seen the Leica SL battery, right? Oh, you just pop it in. Yeah, the uh, T is like that. I have a Leica T okay. that does right. that too. Yeah. It's great. It looks like the bottom of the camera, the battery. Yeah, it's yeah. very, very cool. So yeah. I'd be cool with that. I think my number one problem though is still with the M10 and it plagued me with the M9, which I recently rebought. The M9, M240 and the M10 is better with it, but it still has it, which is the overall sluggishness. I think that's the number oh, yeah, one yeah, problem with that, yeah. the camera mm -hmm. is that you know, when I turn it on, it takes a second before I can take a picture. And if I push the play button, it takes a millisecond longer than it should. And, you know, uh, when you shoot, the buffer is great, but it's not insanely great. It's just great. I want the buffer to be endless. And I did a video where I showed it in comparison to a Nikon D3 from 10 yeah. years ago. 
and I was trying to show how the D3 was so much faster than a camera. And it killed me because everybody came at me and they were like, you don't understand the Leica and you're comparing it to a sports camera. And I'm like, do you understand what 10 years is in digital terms? Like a 10 year old iPhone or a 10 year old iPod or whatever, like 10 year old iPad. Some of these things didn't even exist 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure if I took a 10 year old amateur Nikon, an amateur, not the pro camera, but just any Nikon from 10 years ago, I guarantee you it would still be faster than the M10. And I was so disappointed to find out that the higher resolution M10 monochrome yeah. is slower than the M10. And I, for the life of me, I don't <laughs> understand how they could allow that to be. Like, why did they do that? Why? Okay, so for you, it's sluggishness, eh? Right, and it's the sluggishness of everything, as I said, to turn it on, to get the playback. And the fact that, again, the buffer is great on the camera. Look, I'm firing it now. That's phenomenal. Mm. You don't need to shoot more than that, but I'm hitting the buffer now. I want to never hit the buffer, okay? Never. Yeah, I have icons enough. from 10 years ago, but I will never hit the buffer. See, like now I'm at the buffer and I'm still at the buffer. Again, unlikely that you're really going to uh, have that Okay, problem. so you, don't you, don't mean, you don't mean like shot to shot sluggish. Just you mean like once you hit the buffer, it takes too long to clear it. That sort no, of thing. No, I mean in every way it's sluggish, meaning mm. if I turn on the camera, I cannot yeah. take a picture instantly. I have to wait. If I push the play button, I have to wait half a second before the image comes up. If I push the advanced lever to move the, um, what have you called this? The, if I want to advance the images, image yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't go as fast as I can push the button. If I fire uh, okay, okay. for 10 seconds, I'm going to hit the buffer. I want the camera to just be a speed demon. I want to never hit the buffer. And huh. I'll give you another example of this. Yeah. I think this is a little bit hard to explain. And I've been wanting to kind of get to say this on video and I keep feeling like I can't explain it properly. So I'm going to try to explain it. So do you know how many frames per second a camera shoots? Because I'm not even sure. No, the Leica? Yes, the M10. The it's M10? The three uh, or five. It's, it's one of those, yeah, for sure. Oh, okay. One let's say it's three. We could look it up. Okay. But let's say it's three frames per second. My belief is that you can't push the button three times in one second and have it take a picture because the shutter button is not fast enough to do it. So although in manual mode, maybe you're going to reach your three frames per second if you go to continuous at 2 of a second, right? If I go like this, maybe I'm reaching three frames per second. But if I were to try to push the button three times, the button response is not fast enough to fire the shutter three times in one second. Right. Now, I can do that on a Nikon. The Nikon button, as fast as I can push it, it'll fire. Yeah but the Leica doesn't do it. So the three frames per second, I believe works in continuous, but not in single. Yeah, yeah, that makes because sense. Because there's that millisecond delay when you physically push the button. So for right, me, right. it's just that overall sluggishness. And I have an A6000 that I use for a particular project that I work on. And when I use that camera, it feels so much faster than the M10. And to me, that's like a throwaway camera. I just broke it, the A6000, and I'm looking it up to replace it. It's 250 to replace it used. And it's faster than the M10, and that drives me crazy. Uh, but uh, so I got a what is this thing? I got a um, XT3 here, and this one same okay. thing. It's got this similar type of button, and same thing. You can't press it fast enough. But right. with the XH1, the button style is different. You can press it fast enough to probably get three frames right. a second. So it's, it's very two, similar. So it's button button style, problem. I guess. Right. And no, it's actually yeah. no. It's two different things. One okay. is the button style on the Nikon Pro line. The button just feels snappier. It bounces back up. Oh, yeah, yeah. It doesn't. That's a great button on those that. ones. Oh, it's amazing. It's so snappy. Yeah. But it's not just that. It's also, I think, that the computer can't process, like, take a picture, then it does nothing, and then you say, take a picture, and it does nothing. Mm. You say, take a picture. It doesn't compute fast enough, right, whereas right, the right. Nikon does. So it's not just the physical button. It's the computer is not working fast enough, but I guess if you just hit it in continuous, it does. So that's yeah. how I feel it does. And, <laughs> you know, in, in the last example, I'll give her that sluggishness. Yeah. And I, I don't think anybody realizes this. Like if you take an M9, yeah. you realize the M9 is slower at high ISO than low ISO. So if I'm at like ISO 160, right, 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 the right. buffer recovers quicker than if I'm shooting at like 2500 <laughs> ISO. There's no other camera in the world that shoots yeah. at a different frame rate based on yeah. ISO. That's a sluggishness. That's an improper computer. They've done it wrong from the M9 to the M240. M10 is good. And then now they went slow again on the black and white M10. There's a rumor we're going to get a high resolution M10, right? Which we know we will. Yeah. Are. 
that's going to have the slow, it's going to go back to being slow again. So um, that's my number one um, problem, you know, but let's go the opposite way, right? So when you make that choice to use it for event photography, if you had to cut it down to one thing, tell me the yeah. one main reason why you choose to use a Leica rather than using, you know, whatever, a Nikon. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm basically just an interface guy. So I like things just to be super duper simple, um, especially for event photography. So I didn't tell you the one thing I would change, and I still think it would just be to have some way to lock the shutter speed dial. And the reason right. is I use a lot of flash photography. Right. And if you accidentally, so it kind of locks in the, in the A, as you know, right. it's right. got a hard stop. But then the other one that doesn't, there's just a small detent. And right. the flash mass, maximum speed, as you know, is 180. And if you're, if you've got a flash here, let me get a flash just right. a moment. Okay. And this okay. is funny. If I have I'm, one. If okay. I have one. I have a couple here. I can't get it to you. You're in Japan. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Sorry about this. I got a flash here. Um, so I put the flash on. Just a moment. Okay. Got the flash on. One. I can't really see with the flash on what, I have that problem what the speed all is. the time because I use it with yeah. flash also. Okay. And then the other thing is if, if I'm having to tighten this thing or just kind of play with the back, my finger here is, is very near to the shutter speed dial. And because of that, the chances that I'm going to rotate that right. are pretty high. Right. right. And so uh, like I lot. said in my video, I've only lost one frame in five years. Right. But that was an error that was didn't have to be forced, and I wish there was some way, either to put either to put this shutter speed dial on a pylon, where you can depress it, so you don't have to see anything external, and then when it's depressed, freely rotate, and then when it's pressed again, it has a lock. I would love that. Right. That would be the only thing I would probably change. Right. I don't I'd have be a problem okay with speed. that. But yeah. in my video, I actually said the opposite of you in that regard, <laughs> and that's the thing about like when you're the manufacturer of something, you can't please everybody. It's like making right. a Star Wars movie. You know, if you change the characters, everybody gets mad. You keep everything, <laughs> everybody gets mad. So for me, and I do about 95% of my shooting with this without using a flash. And for me, right. you know, this ends up being my exposure compensation. So once right, I'm right. at a reasonably high ISO, then it doesn't matter whether I'm at a shutter speed of like right. 750, 1,500, right. 250, 160, they're all going to produce the same picture. And this becomes how I, brighten and darken the image. I take a shot, look right. at the back, and then I just roll this. I know what direction to roll it. So I like the fact that it doesn't lock. But um so there's no way to please everybody with so many of these. But, but if if, if it was if it was on a, a rised pylon where you could right. just depress it and it would freely rotate, it would still work like well, that. Well the way you described it, you right? it would be a little bit like the ISO dial where there's a method where it will never change and then there's a way to set it yeah. where it can be changed by just rolling it with one thing. Could we if, if we did, did that, that could we please both of us? Yes, that would be perfect. You got to let us design it and we'd be good to go. <laughs> All right. But the question now is gonna yeah. be um, okay. yeah. what's the number one thing, or it could be more than one thing, that drew you to using a Leica when again clearly that's a choice. You know technically a Nikon or a Canon or even a Fuji is better, but if you have to boil it down, what is it that makes you choose to use this camera instead? It's it's kind of a story. I mean, when I started doing embassy events, I was using um, a Nikon D800, and as a sub, I used a X Pro One, I think. Right. And at the time, I was still just using manual lenses. Um, I I guess I. I've done a lot of autofocus, but I just, for some reason, I use manual lenses. And I found even with, although when I was doing weddings at another studio, I did, they, I had to use the autofocus. They said I had to use autofocus. So I brought my, I had a 28 to 80, I think it, 28 to 70 or 28. It was a big Nikon 2.81. And um, so I had to use it then, but I noticed that with an SLR, when the lights go down, it was, the autofocus worked great, but it was hard for me to see. And that's of course, because the, I guess the, the thing, because it's TTL, all the light comes in through the lens, and if there's not enough light coming in through the lens, you can't really see. Right, and when you change lenses, yeah. if you put on a 50 yeah. millimeter prime, it just, the image is going to be yeah. brighter. If you change it to a zoom, yeah. it's just going right. to be darker. Right, what you're looking right. at the viewfinder, correct. And with the M, you can put on a lens that <laughs> you can put on the lens cap and, and still see what's going on. Right. Um, you know, when it gets super dark, it's, I would say, at night, you know, when you have like a single light in the house, a tiny light, in the, and then you go to a dark corner, then I find it hard to focus. But at the same time, my, my mirrorless camera cannot focus at that, at that depth. 
So I like the fact that this is not TTL. The, the viewfinder has gotten better every generation. Um, right. And I use glasses, horrible, horrible nasty glasses. Um, and I have no problem focusing right. any lens. Cool. I, I just love it. I, it's so... Re- Philip Reeves says that it's like unreliable to use a rangefinder, but I find it so reliable because it doesn't matter what lens it is, you have the exact same interface. It's always just as bright. Right. As long as you know how to use it, it's, there's nothing else to, it's like, it's like popping into, um, it's okay. It's not, it's not really, but it's like, you know, when you, you, if you rent a car, if you have a, a car that has a manual transmission, it doesn't matter what car it is, you know how to drive it. But if it has right. an automatic, every single one has a different interface. And Correct. And maybe what happens is, yeah. like you said, every, if you, every car you rent, every, as soon as you rent a car, it takes five. You know what's even worse, by the way, since you mentioned like renting a car, you get yeah. to the hotel, you get in a shower, and you can't figure out how to turn the water on, oh, how to yeah, turn yeah. water on in a cold, because <laughs> yeah. everyone has a completely different system. Right. It's something so right. simple about hot and cold water, and right, right. you get the shower to come out instead right. of the water at the bottom. But go on with what you're saying. Yeah, no, it, I mean, it's just simple. Like a, a manual car, the only difference I've seen is where the reverse gear is. On a European car, the reverse is usually up near first, and you either press down and then shift over, or there's like a lever where you pull up and then shift over. And on a Japanese and American car, it reverses below five. Right. But that's for every car across the planet. It's just once you get in, you know how to do it. Right. And with an automatic and, car, you have to learn the interface. And with right. a, a TTL camera, I, I just noticed you got it every time you put on a new lens you got to adapt to how the lens looks through the yeah, camera that is this one thing, of the, it's, yeah that is one of the most interesting things about using a leica number one the view the, the viewfinder the view when you look through the lens well we look through the viewfinder i should say the view never changes which incidentally right. is just how your eyes work even yeah. though you know when it's your daughter on that stage all you see is your daughter you've mentally yeah, tuned yeah. out and blocked out everything but <laughs> Your vision never changes. Yeah. It's always the same. And that's what a Leica M series is like. Every time you look through the viewfinder, the view is exactly the same, no matter what lens right. you're on. Very different from a uh, DSLR or especially different than a mirrorless. But the part that you're saying about how it doesn't change even goes a little bit further to the degree that, you know, I have a lot of cameras, video cameras, all this stuff. And, you know, I have a GoPro. And, man, I have filmed so many clips with the GoPro in the wrong mode because the same button that you use to turn the GoPro on and off is also the button that you use to change what it's in. So if I'm filming in regular video, in my case, that's 1080p for GoPro video. Sometimes when I go to turn it off, I actually end up changing it to like time-lapse. Then the next time I turn it on, it's in time-lapse instead of being where I wanted it to be. And if you just turn it on and start filming, you don't realize that you filmed the clip in slow motion or in time lapse. So you are, how many times you yeah. pick up your iPhone to take a picture and it's in photo instead of video or it's in panoramic or oh, yeah, HDR yeah. and all these things. And one of the really nice things about this camera is that you can see what it's set on when it's turned off, which is extremely right, right, rare right. in digital age that things right, don't usually right. work that way. But this is always the same. It's always in photo mode. You know why? Because that's all it does is take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> it's always ready to shoot, which is why yeah. I wish it were a little snappier because uh, it's always ready to shoot, but you have to wait that, you know, okay. that one second before it goes. Now, I think for me, the number one reason that I use it is because I think the contrast between using the Leica and my Nikons makes me a better photographer in a sense that using the range font, using the Leica in a way makes everything difficult. It's like writing a poem instead of just writing a paragraph. You know, it's, it's an extra obstacle to overcome. You have to manually focus it and you have to, you have to be, you can't just put it on program and just blast away. You have to set the exposure manually. You really have to check what you're doing in terms of the exposure. So when I use the Leica, it's more like an artistic tool. And when I use my Nikon, I feel like I'm more in a work mode. If I want things to be super, super easy, yeah. I use the Nikon and I can just right. blast it without thinking. Right. And when I want to enjoy the process more, I use the Leica. And I think the two of them work so well together like that for me. I use the Nikon with the Leica all the time. And Have we gone a little pretentious? That, no. <laughs> uh, no, not at all. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I hope not, because again, I'm I'm using it and I'm using it like a tool. And yeah, yeah. I can't understand why other companies haven't made a camera like this. Like there are so many Fuji cameras 
There yeah, are, yeah, yeah. I'm right, there's an X10 and an X20. And then like you said, there's right, this right, right. one that is this hybrid of like an X3 yeah. and, and a video cam. Like they make so many cameras, but they won't just make a camera that has like four buttons and is right, really right. stripped down. It's so strange. The, the X Pro is probably, and the X100 are probably their simplest cameras in terms of buttons. I mean, like check out the, the X-T3, look, look at all those. Like right. there's a, so you got this of course, right. but then there's on the front, there's like a, mm -hmm. oh, it's a meter. So there's three different meters here, three meter set or four, four different meter settings underneath it. And by the way, if it's so tiny, I don't have big fingers. You can't even but, change it. But, yeah. but I, I end up pressing the, the IS or the shutter speed dial at the same time. So you have to lock it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that, this thing always changes. You pick up this camera and right. you're going to change it. Um, and then this you know, thing, my, this uh, one I hate, man. My, what is it, which one is it? It's the A6000 is like that for me. There's a thumb okay, dial yeah. on the back and I'm shooting in manual mode. And yeah. man, every time I pick it up, it's on God knows what shutter speed. It, if there were a way to lock them, it would be maybe okay. But the, the Fujifilms, like even my wife, and she has thin, well, she's right. a woman. Right? She's got right. thin woman fingers. And even with her, and with those tiny nails that you should be able to pick up like an atom, she right. still accidentally changes settings on it whenever she picks up the camera. Right. So yeah, I mean, the, the there's nothing here. There's nothing. Yeah, it's just on the, on the simple. And you know, it's <laughs> the only camera also that you know how everything. First of all, everything as the years go on gets more and more buttons. So if you look at an icon, right. one, right. then you look at the new what is it D six? I guess it is. Obviously, there's more buttons on a D six right, than right. a D one. And then if you look at a Leica, if you did from the M nine to the M ten you see fewer buttons on the M10 yeah. than the M9. And <laughs> crazy enough, excuse me, there are certain places on the camera that you can look at, compare it to a film Leica, and it actually has fewer buttons as well. So if right. I look at the top of an M10, it's less busy than the top of like an M4 no, that's true. or an M7. That's true. And the front is less busy on an M10 than an M4 right. or an M7 or an M6 because they lost that uh, big, ugly battery thing in the front. So nobody has removed buttons and I wish like Fuji in particular, they really should make an X100 that has just two or three buttons and controls. I think it would sell like crazy. They should make a black and white X100. It would sell like no, crazy. No, I agree. I totally agree. And what none of <laughs> seems to understand is that in the film days, like when I was using a Nikon um, an F4, which was the film pro yeah, camera, the right. F4 and the F5, I always had an FM2 in my bag. That was the stripped down Nikon. It was so small and it just had a shutter speed dial. It didn't need batteries. And a lot of pros would carry something like an FM2 or an FE2 in their bag alongside the fully featured camera. And I think if Nikon made a stripped down camera like that or Fuji made it, I think a ton of people would buy those cameras. I think there's a real desire to have something different. But yeah, right. I don't know why those companies are so afraid to do it. Well, especially today, like uh, we have uh, the the camera companies and the the, the forums, they're always talking about decline, declining camera sales. And I think what that does is the people that stay in the camera world are the people that are either real gearheads that are just really into the cameras or people that are really into photography. And because you're, you're basically draining or sifting into the, the very bottom of the hardcore enthusiast, you're going to have of that small group, you're gonna have more people that'd be more interested in that. Whereas before, you probably have more people that'd be like, why would you do that, man? You, you gotta get all the bells and whistles because they're just, they just want a camera that's, you know, just does everything all at once. Does everything. Now, well, that's yeah. another thing, which we'll talk about that in a second, but the thing about the, the what they're doing is, yeah, they keep making all the same camera. There's really no reason to buy an 850 over an 810 from Nikon or the X-T3. Right. All the same camera, which is why I don't understand why they don't make one that is truly different with different controls or one that is black and white. And at least to right. like his credit, they make different cameras. They go, oh, you know, let's make one without a screen. You're like, without a screen? Go, yeah, <laughs> now who wants that? I don't know, but at least it's different. The black and white camera, the one without the screen, and the one with the screen. Those are three the, dramatically the, different cameras. The, what, what I find, um, I, I like that they do that. What I don't like is people that hate Leica, they'll always bring that up as like, right. um, when another company does something they don't like, they're like, well, you're doing exactly what Leica do. They're taking out the screen. It's like, well, that's only one camera and Leica is not forcing you to buy that. They're giving yeah, they you four options with or three screen. options, you know? Right, yeah. right. And they oh, that, but that's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, you, well, have, you have your base M10, you've got the P, you've got the monochrome, right. and then 
you might have the one without a screen. I mean, that's the D. That's yeah, brilliant. Yeah, Isn't I think brilliant? it's fantastic. There are three yeah. very different variants, yeah. much more different than cameras that have come out. Over. In other words, those are all in the same line. Those are all 3M10s. Yeah, yeah. I would argue those 3M10s are more different from each other than a Nikon D5 is from a Nikon D6, even though there's probably a four-year difference between those two cameras. Those cameras are essentially the same camera, but you cannot tell me that a color M10 is anything like a black and white M10. Mm -hmm. And I dare you to go take the one without a screen and show me a good picture. Like the average person is never going to get a good photograph. <laughs> but if you just gave it to some guy, you're, yeah. you're, you're at the zoo and you yeah. see a guy with the camera yeah. and you hand him the Leica without a screen on the back and said, yeah. yeah, photograph your kids at the zoo today. He's not coming back with anything. You have no idea what he's doing. Those three cameras <laughs> are far more different than, like I said, a D4 or rather a D5 to a D6. So... I think uh, other companies should really follow their lead, you know, should follow no, them. I agree with that. You know, Especially if, niche, niche companies like Fujifilm, for sure. Right. And, and the other funny thing is whenever they make a collector's item, a collector's camera, which again, and I don't like most of those. There was the one that had pictures on the camera. I don't want anybody else's pictures uh, on my camera. Yeah, that's kind of... That's tacky. That's tacky. Yeah, stuff. like it's not, you know, you look at it. And first of all, you don't want you to look at the pictures once. <laughs> How many times are you going to stop and look at the pictures? It makes no sense. But they're not. Probably if you're buying a camera with pictures on it, you're probably not using it to take pictures because yeah, it's, even it's already to. itself a, a yeah. museum piece. You know, they're, they're done so. already. They're done already. But I like that the comments, whenever they make a new in the comments, there's always somebody who says that's taking away from Leica making a new, like say M11, oh, yeah. as if the same guy <laughs> is working on the collector's edition is who no, making M11. No, I think you no can do way. both. You could make a special yeah. edition and keep the line moving forward, you know. But also that's pretty right. sure those, those collector editions, that some of them are so tacky. It's like, nah, man. That was like some celebrity just had an idea. It's like, hey, I got this yeah. ping pong paddle. Hey, take the back off it and put it on there. And that, yeah. It and wasn't like engineering. Kravitz, he seems like such a cool guy. And I love the fact yeah. that he uses this black and white Leica. And it's yeah. like the ugliest. It's like a snakeskin brown camera. <laughs> it's so ugly to me. But man, yeah. those white ones are nice. Did you see those? The two white ones. The ghost, ghost or whatever? Snow There's, or ghost? Yeah, those are beautiful. There man. are two of them. I don't know which is the ghost. Yeah. One is a white and one is like a little yeah. grayish white. They are both yeah, yeah. gorgeous, man. I would buy one of those. Like I would really walk around with the white camera. I think it's a beautiful camera and I'm, I'm glad they did that. But I think for me next, I'm going to get the black and white sometime this year and I'll probably end up with the higher resolution version at some point. Oh, yeah. You know, I might end yeah. up keeping this though because it's going to be faster than those and for the times when I want to just right. make shots, right. then I'll probably- Yeah, they need to change the process or something in there to, keep, I mean, to make it fast enough. How crazy is this? So they called this processor a Maestro 2. Don't ask me how I know this. I read too much Leica stuff. It's better than Meister right. One. Right. I guess, yeah. I guess it is. That was probably from 1940 or something. But <laughs> if that processor was correct for this 24 megapixel camera, what made them think it was appropriate for a 40 megapixel camera? It's not. It's obviously it's going to no be too slow. So it really should have been a Maestro 3 or something. You know, it really. Or it, it, what if it's just some, like, what if the processor itself is fast enough, but it's like some incongruity with like the, the mechanical nature of the M. Like, here's a, yeah. this is going to sound like conspiracy, right. but what if it's like a ghost in the machine sort of thing where the machine is rejecting the computer or the, the mechanical nature of the M is like, nah, right. it's pushing no, back it against to the computer. Slow. But you know, yeah. I really wish I had saved it, but um, I was in, there's a Leica M10 user group. Man, I wish, I might have to go look for this thread. It was fascinating. So I made a video saying, why is the Leica M10 so sluggish? Okay, and I just talked about a few things about why it was so slow. And in the comments, there were people who honestly seemed to believe that the camera is made to be slow. That like, that's a part <laughs> of the design that it should be slow. And this blew my mind. I'm like, this camera was not made to be slow. It was not. Like they're like, it gives you time to stop and think and all this nonsense. <laughs> and what I did was, it took me 20 minutes. I did a search online for Leica ads. I just searched every ad, M4, M2, M5, whatever. The word speed shows up so often in Leica advertisements. You'd be shocked at how much of their advertising talked about how fast the camera is. So no one can ever tell me that a Leica was designed to be a slow camera. It was actually designed to be a fast camera. That was their whole thing was how speedy and quick the camera mm. is, not slow. And um, I have this idea for a video, but again, it's one of those that I think is a little hard to explain, but I, I would want to explain the two types of limitations when you're using an M 
and I want to categorize them into two different categories. One would be the limitations that are inherent to the camera. These are the limitations that basically should be there that we're not mad at. So those limitations would be mm. things like yeah, yeah. you can't shoot close. You can't really shoot action because it takes time to right, manually right, right. focus. You can't frame accurately because you're not looking through the lens. Um, right. To hold it can be a little weird because, you know, you don't have a grip. So if you're going to do like eight, 10 hours holding it, it can be a little hard. Yeah. Okay. The, or the base plate. These are things built into the platform that I'm not mad at. To me, they're just a part of having a Leica. But then there's this other category of limitations with the camera that should not be there, that should not be there, that are just design flaws, things like taking too long to turn on. Or if you're using an M9, for example, uh, you know, sometimes it won't read a card or it'll give you an error or, you know, you'll shoot and you have to take the battery out, you know, those type of limitations. And I think some Leica people, some Leica fans actually confuse themselves and they think that the slowness of the camera, the sluggishness, is one of those sort of good limitations. And it's not. Like, they're just yeah. wrong. Because again, you can mm. look at the advertising. If I can find yeah. them, if I save the ads, but how many times? I mean, I pulled up like 10 ads <laughs> that all talk about how fast the camera is. Clearly, being slow is not a design feature. It's not a good flaw in the Leica. It's a bad flaw in the M series. Have you used um, the later M film M's that had uh, TTL metering in them? No, I'd never used a film Leica. My first okay. camera was the M9, which I loved. Okay. And again, I loved it so much. I actually just rebought this like three months ago. <laughs> I rebought yeah, it. It's a nice camera. Oh, yeah. The, the image quality is like so good, even though, you know, it's slow and all that stuff. But it, I, if I, I use it with the M10, I'm good. I ask that because I haven't used um, a Leica film camera that has a battery in it. Right. So I just have an M2. And of course, that one, there's no on or off, right? You just right. cock it and, and shoot. Um, but uh, yeah, I wonder, like I said, not ghost in the machine, not conspiracy stuff. I could go conspiracy toe to toe with a normal person. <laughs> but but um, like uh, it is, there is definitely, there's like about a second wait for me at least. I don't know. Um, I know that with the M240, it's probably a second and a half. Correct. So almost two right. seconds. And this one's right. faster. So there we are. It's faster compared to the M240. But, 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 but let me just cut yeah. you really quick. Remember, though, we're going <laughs> back to being slow with the black and white one because it's the yeah. same computer, yeah, yeah. but it's handling 40 megapixels. So yeah. we're slower when we're pushing the button to review images. We're going back in time yeah. and we're being slow again. So it, they, It's still... It, it's ghost in the machine, man. But here, here wait, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test the, like, here's the X-T3 right. Fujifilm's fastest camera. It does have it, you know, uh, this is unfair. I've got an adapted lens. Let me turn on a, okay. let me put on a, a native lens here. Uh, Firmware is updated. So uh, here, so camera's off. I'm going to turn it to single focus, whatever. Right. Um, and then I'm just going to mash the button and let's just see what happens. So how long, okay, I'm turning it on. Okay. And, <laughs> let me let me take oh, off the lens take cap. the lens cap off. This is great. <laughs> Everybody's okay. clicking okay. off the video right now. <laughs> Do it again though. Let me see how long I'm, it I'm takes. a professional. I'm a professional. All right, all right. It's off, on, and that's horrible. But yeah. but I'm gonna let them slide. You know why? Because the camera is doing it. The camera at least has the EVF that it has to activate. At least it's firing nicely now. But but it's, it's, a, it's about a second. It's about it's a second. It's way too long. But just to yeah. be mad at Leica, I'm going to say, because it's an EVF, it takes longer to boot up the computer. Yeah, Leica, yeah the, the Leica, no excuse. There's no reason yeah, that it, it's this slow. It doesn't even have a movie mode. It, it, acts, it acts like a, a range finder. It acts like a mirrorless camera. Right. It acts and like a mirrorless technically it's a mirrorless, but it's not what we think of when we say mirrorless yeah. camera. So there's really no reason that this camera should be slow. And for them, and again, the M10 is okay. I'm okay with the speed. I'd like it to be faster, but I'll let it slide. But for them to now go slower with the black and white M10, and I'm sure the upcoming M10 higher resolution version will be slow also. Do you spend any time, say, reading any of the forums or any of the reviews? Because I know for me, sometimes it can be frustrating. And I know it sounds bad, but like I've got my opinion and I read something different. Sometimes it just riles me up and I'm like telling my wife and she really doesn't care. But I'm worked up because I read a review or something like that. But do you spend any time looking at things like that? 
Okay, I'm a heavily opinionated person and I, I do read certain reviews. I, I get to, because I'm heavily opinionated about very many things, I tend to ignore a lot of other opinions because they, either they just, I, I look down on them. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I, I get that way sometimes. Yeah. yeah, in a good way. I think way. they're silly. Yeah. Well, I don't know if mine are good or not. It could be character flaw. But like, um, I do read reviews, um, but I tend to just look at the pictures that someone takes. Okay. And it, you know, it's not because if they take good pictures, what they wrote is worth more. It's just because I tend to. <laughs> I'm like, how did you miss that thing? Or if they're being, or if they're being too specific, it's like, how are you hung up on that? So. I tend not to, however, when there's like a super famous person that picks up a Leica, for instance, and then, or someone that the community knows, and then they review it, I'll read it because it's interesting for me to look at a person that, that's famous, that everyone looks up to, or, or people read, who then uses a Leica, who doesn't normally use one, even if it's positive or negative, I like to know what they're talking about. And I guess I, this would probably bring me to the Philip Reed review. Right. I'm not sure if you It's Reeve, you read I think. Is, is it Reeve? Reeve, sorry. Reeve. Reeve. Philip right. Philip Reeve. Reeve. Yeah, 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 I did actually read yeah. the review. Yeah. Yeah. So he's he's a uh, he's not like Tony Northrop famous, but he's uh, in the right. blogosphere. I think he's probably right. in the lower third quadrant of the popular people. <laughs> like right. if I'm right. if I'm like one one hundredth <laughs> or one one thousandth, right. He's like he's like three hundred percent. Right. Or something like that. Right. Yeah, um, more up there. Yeah. Right. So yeah, what did yeah. you think of that review? I actually didn't read the review, but what did you make of it? Okay. So I, I, I didn't know what he thought about Leica before it. So I found out that he doesn't like Leica, but he took some interesting, well, he took the normal photographs you expect someone will take from a Leica review. It's a lot of street, a lot of kind of slower, you know, taking pictures of someone drinking coffee or whatever. And that's, that's fine. Um, but he ended up taking the sort of normal photographs that the person takes while they're doing a Leica review, but then kind of bag it on Leica the entire time, which, it, you know, it's fine. If you're a Leica user, you're probably used to everyone bagging on Leica. There's a new Leica announcement and everyone's like, eh, stupid Leica sheeps, doctors and, and uh, endocrinologists and dentists and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, well, they exist fine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Most of, it, most of the people that own a D6 are probably not professional sports photographers, you know? Right. Probably more people are amateurs. Of course. Yeah, that the, the real pros, yeah. it's, it's 1% of the market. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, if, right. Probably not even 1%, right? Yeah, right, exactly. So, like, um, I, that doesn't bother me. What The things that he talked about, I think, in the first page or the early on in the review, is like, and they, they got the made in Germany printed on the back. It's not hidden. And it's like, of course it's not. It's not because, no, I, I happen to be a person that, that, that thinks that if you make something in your country, and you're proud of the work that right, your people right, do, you should right. display it. Like um, right. that, that GFX on the back, it says made in Japan. Right. It, right. Like Philip Reeve, can you take a look at the GFX? Can right. you they now did the tag on the GFX? Right. And I can see putting made in Germany considering yeah. every other camera is made in Japan. So you're yeah, making exactly. a distinction that this is something different. Yeah, that doesn't yeah. bother me that them writing. No, I, I, well, I think I I, personally, I think it's great. Yeah. Um, now, now, evidently, it's made in Portugal and assembled in Germany, but still, you know, it's the part where they wrote made in Germany, they probably did that part in Germany, so. Yeah, <laughs> this part, this, that, this part here that we put on, we, we've stamped it, and the stamping right. machine is made in Germany, right. that, that whatever it is. In Germany, <laughs> yeah. right, so maybe. They're... Whatever it is, like, it's assembled in Germany, the parts are manufactured in Portugal. There's evidently a factory there. I have a friend who's a Fujifilm or Sony user. He, he's visited the Leica factory there. Really cool guy into earphones and stuff. Right. <laughs> he won't come on this conversation. But anyway, yeah. No, I like, I like, I like that people can be proud of the work that, that ostensibly was done by their people in their country. Right, so right. I don't see how that's... Um, and, and it's obvious if it's made in China, and there are a lot of cameras that are, you know, they're designed in Japan, made in China, so they can keep the profit margin higher. Um, the camera price doesn't change. Uh, but like, why would you hide? Why would you, why would you, if you're a Japanese company, why would you put in big bold letters made in China right. on, on the camera it was designed in, you know? Right, of course you're gonna put your country, yeah, the country yeah. you really wanna represent. So right. I feel that's Would anything else bother you with that review though? Like anything else, like jump uh, out? The, well, at the end, he was like, the price, it's not worth the price. And 
I th think there's a problem with the, we in the camera world especially um, have a problem with this thing about worth. There's cost and there's worth. And those things are two very different things. If a person is either professional or amateur or hobbyist, doesn't matter. Right. And they pick up a camera and it feels good and they use it. Right. And they have the money for it. Right. What is it worth to them? What, yeah. What, what is it worth to them? I, I, I think right. that's, Plus, there's also the, I think there's another thing, and this is something I argued when I first picked up an M240, and it was that if you're a Leica user, there tends to be, now, it's not always the case, but there tends to be less body churn. So you're not, once you less pick body up a Leica, it, again? churn. So you're not churning through a million bodies. So if you're a, oh, if okay, you're a right, wireless right, user, okay. like you're going like, to like, start yeah. out in the Sony world or the mm -hmm. Canon world, and you're going to move over to Fujifilm, then maybe go to Panasonic, maybe go to Olympus. Right. If you calculate everything you've done, you could have bought one or two Leicas. Right. Right. Absolutely. Right. How much money have you spent? Right. How much money have you yeah, spent yeah. going from the D4 to the D5 to the D6? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't... you might have just stuck with an M240 and you would have been good the whole right, time. Right. 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 That so, makes sense. I mean... You're stuck with, yes, if you get a Leica, it can't do all the things that your mirrorless camera or your DSLR can do, but you know that. Right. <laughs> if you bought the Leica, you're probably thinking, what can I do with it, you know, a little bit more. Or, you know, if you're super, if you're super rich, fine. You got it. It's a beautiful piece right. for your wall. You put up Who as cares? a piece of art, yeah. But the yeah. weird thing about, the, about Leica is that whenever yeah. someone writes an article about Leica, <laughs> like on DP Review or F-Stop or yeah. some Petapixel, some guy always has to put in the comments like, yeah, it's really expensive. You could get eight uh, Nikons for that price. And I go, oh, but everything has something expensive. Like if, you have, if you're into yeah. watches, there's expensive watches, expensive yeah, yeah. restaurants, cars. Does this same guy go to restaurant reviews and go, oh, you go to McDonald's and get eight Happy Meals for the price of one meal in that restaurant? Yeah, like, that's fair. That's also fair. <laughs> I don't understand that. They're always pointing it out with Leica though. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, it's expensive. Pro photo lights are expensive too. Some people choose to get those over um, Godox or whatever. That's I just sold my pro photo lights and I replaced them. Oh, really? Them with, which, uh, ones, which ones did you sell? I, I just had the D1s. And before oh, okay. that, I had the Pro 300 heads with generators. Um, yeah. The generators, they worked great. I, you can power with something like 3,000 watts or whatever right. per head. The just right. incredible amount of light. But um, no, uh, if you notice, now. this, by the way, we're shooting inside my still life studio. Right. Um, it's uh, four meters, I think, by three meters. Not a big place. You don't need that much power. So I was using, I uh, downgraded or side graded to D1s because they had wireless. Right, so I didn't have to, I didn't have to connect via wires or PC syncs. And um, so that was great. But at the same time, if I ever wanted to take them outside, then I would need a battery pack. You need right, the Go, kind of Godox. Wait, oh, my Godox are in a different room. Um, I just got two of them at the moment. <clears throat> it's generally enough for what I do. Although if I'm doing very, very, detailed stuff I'll need I need four lights but generally just two um, but yeah they're battery I can get around 200 to 300 images and if I'm doing a um, if I'm doing like an image stack right I'll go through that in a single shot oh okay uh, right single yeah, image but, shots. right but if I'm doing that sort of shot I'm only going to be doing one a day anyway. So. <laughs> right. And if you're in a studio, you can always just keep recharging it. You can stop and right. recharge. It's exactly. not like yeah, you're yeah. at the beach or something and you're stuck. Yeah. But I have the, um, I have one D1, D500 Air left, but I yeah. have um, two sets of those uh, B10, right? It's the B10. Oh, B10s. The, the ones the, with the, the pack and the they head. Have a, they have a uh, yeah, pack and head, yeah. And the cord. Uh, yeah, those string, are phenomenal. Yeah. But I think I'm going to get yeah. two B2s. I think I might be saying the numbers wrong. I think the B2 is what I have. The B10 is the one that's alone. But I have the one that has the pack in a head. I have two of those, which okay. is four right. lights total. But I think I'm going to get two B10s eventually, just to kind of round out the kit and have a yeah, yeah. perfect kit. But um, you know, they're they're, way, they're, they're way more reliable. The the Godox. Um, yeah. I also found like okay, if you if you do all your own lighting, um, <laughs> what's the word? Uh, modifications yourself. Right. Then the the lighting. Um, like for instance, the, the dome that comes with it or the, the, the reflector, the zoom reflector, whatever, right, on the, right, pro, the on the right. pro photo, the, the that one, okay. mm -hmm. that one on the pro photo gives you a nice round circle on the Godox. It's like a square. Oh, okay. And so I've had to do different things to make sure that it's round. So the lighting quality, so that's more even, quite is good. Right. Yeah. If you put it into like a big, like Westcott modifier or something, I, I don't yeah. think there's much of a difference between, between the pro photo. Um, and also the wireless transmission on the Pro Photo is way more reliable. However, okay. 
oh, I can take it outside. And overall, I mean, once you've figured out the little problems of the Godox, right, it works out just it works as well. Great. Yeah. yeah, but they dropped the price on mine. Mine were like, like in America, they were like $1,100 for the pack and two heads, right. which was about a third really? of what it was originally. Yeah, because once it came up to the B10, bucks. something like that. Yeah, it's very cheap. They dropped the price dramatically when the B10 came out. Yeah. So they still have them in stock at like B&H Photo. Look it up. The B2. Huh. They're pretty sure it's the B2 it's called. They are yeah. very, very cheap and it's super lightweight. I was just saying, it's, it, one thing about the markets is I find introduction prices in the States are way cheaper than Japan for a lot of the stuff. But then Japan's market for a lot of stuff is in real time, it just drops. What does that mean um, when but, you say the market drops? Uh, the market value for everything. You can watch it. There's a oh, website okay. called kakaku.com. So the real time, the re, in real time, you can watch these shops dropping the price daily. Oh, that's And then every once in a while, it's weird. Every month, they shoot back up. Right. And then it drops. And then over time, you know, it, it, it's a line like this, of course. Right. But in America, I've seen the initial price is lower, but then it stays right. steady like that. Yeah, the price. And then there's sales. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, to me, it stays. But yeah, take a look at those. They don't have sales here. Yeah, gee, they don't. That's funny. But the uh, B2, it was funny. I was in California, and I texted my friend who works at B&H Photo. Yeah. that Sammy's, which is a big famous store in California, yeah, camera yeah. store, they have a great rental department. They were selling used B2 units for more money than what B&H was selling the new B2s for. Yikes. Their <laughs> use was more. That's how cheap the B2 dropped. Ah, it right, was right, so right, right. low in price. Yeah, like yeah, I said, yeah. it was about a half or a third of what it was new. And um, they still have them. If you want to, you know, check B&H and definitely check that. <laughs> if I but, can get it shipped. Well, right, I don't want to switch systems Well, if you ever come here, I'll pick it up for you, whatever. Yeah, but yeah, sure, right sure. now, all the Leica people are going like, lighting? I don't understand. What, what, what is it? Oh, uh, yeah. You know, I zone focus and I shoot Leica. on the street. You know, they're all like, Lighting's you know? a disaster. <laughs> I used to have uh, Leica flashes, um, Leica, Leica branded flashes from Nishin. And uh, they work. You know, they do the TTL actually really well. I was surprised. They do the TTL really well. But um, in the end, I just, I always just use um, a big flash and, and set it manually. I have a great one. Let me just show you that. Hold on one yeah, second. Bring it up. But anyway, all the like of people right now are going like, what are they talking about lighting? I don't know what that is, you know? <laughs> so we're going to wrap there. But Nathan, thank you, man. Really, really appreciate yeah. that. Uh, you know, appreciate your time and talking about these things. Well, thank you very much for the invite. Yeah, thank you, man, for coming through. And uh, I don't know, hopefully we cleared up a little bit of misconceptions that people have about these cameras and why we use them. And they won't think that everybody who uses them is pretentious and putting it on a shelf and all this other <laughs> nonsense. I don't know. There was poetry in this conversation. <laughs> it, was, it was beautiful. All right, so thank you, man.